we like to think of the kind of instruction um, that we wish to afford our students as instruction that is interdisciplinary. That is, it combines things like art history and business, or art history and chemistry, or curatorial studies um, and anthropology, or art history and English uh, to make up careers and other kinds of uh, uh, academic initiatives and artistic initiatives that satisfy the needs of our students today in the 21st century. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I did not include conservation um, in that interdisciplinary uh, mix. Um, so I want to just pose a few questions uh, before I turn over uh, the podium to our first panel. Um, and, and I think we can ourselves together throughout the day and the sessions uh, think about ways to continue to pose questions in the field of art conservation. And so uh, one of the first questions I have is how would the history of art look different if there were more black conservators? Which works would be conserved and how would this affect cultural heritage preservation? What is valued and how? What gets collected or discarded? Which works are available for scholars, students, students, and artists to study? Today we're going to take a close look at the conservation experiences and projects from experts as well as curators with an eye on select works from the renowned collections at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art and the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum. And that's another really important reason as to why we are here today. Not only why we are doing the work of To Conserve a Legacy here at the AUC today, but also why the AUC Art Collective is here uh, as well, to think about the kinds of, of artists, people like Hale Woodruff and Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, uh, who came before us in the mid 20th century and built the collections at the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum, and also the strong tradition of teaching the arts at the Atlanta University Center. We're going to have time to talk over lunch, and, and we also will have time as we cover ground uh, in what I'd like to think of today as a movable, movable feast uh, from Spelman College to Clark Atlanta University uh, to the Woodruff Library. We hope to inspire you to consider art conservation as a field of study and as a career. I know that there are many professionals here from the Early Conservation Professionals Network that will share their experiences with you as well. Um, so we're really interested in inspiring uh, new students who are studying here at the AUC, but also teachers as well, um, and others who are, who are involved in um, the interdisciplinary arts. We also hope that this is a chance for us to all meet uh, new leaders in the field, to make connections, um, to consider how we might mentor one another. And we'll also conclude, as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, at the Woodruff Library with a special viewing of Ted Stanley's collection of conservation journals and materials. I'm really excited to thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the very hard and industrious work of Rachel Brown and Lauren Harris, of the Early Conservation Professionals Network and Caitlin Lee, of Spelman Technology Services, our guest conservators, thank you so much for traveling from afar, our invited speakers, our partners at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum, the Woodruff Library, the Department of Art and Visual Culture, Spelman College, and uh, we would not be here doing what we're doing today without the generous support of the Alice L. Walton Foundation. Uh, I want to conclude my remarks by asking you to please silence your cell phones um, if you are Instagramming, which I hope that you are, or uh, tweeting, which you might be as well. But if you are Instagramming, we are at AUC underscore art collective all together, no spaces. Um, I'd also like to uh, ask that you please refer to your programs for full presenter biographies. And um, without further ado, I wish to uh, introduce our first panel today. The session is What is Art Conservation? And on this panel, we will have Lestarsha D. McGarity, who is the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Objects Conservation at the National Gallery of Art and Shannon A. Brogdon Grantham, who is a Spelman College alumna from the class of 2009, and a photographs and paper conservator at the Smithsonian 
uh, Museum Conservation Institute. So without further ado, uh, we welcome you to join us and thank you so much, all of you, for coming today. Um, the application fee, which varies by school, but 
is no more than $100. And letters of recommendation, which you need to start early because they have to be there before your application is there and you don't want to have to do anything last minute. So once you've done all of that, on top of your pre-program experience, and anything that we do before school, we refer to as pre-program. And those are internships, jobs, fellowships. You need a certain number of hours to apply for school. The minimum is listed as 400, but often people apply with 1,500 hours or more of experience hours before school. But once you've gotten through all this and you've made it to the point of getting an interview, you have to bring things with you. Um, so that's something you need to be aware of if you're going to pursue this. Um, so you have to bring a presentation of your conservation experiences that includes collection care, conservation treatment, working in museums, um, even doing, um, I did, I included like being a tour guide at my campus museum because we talked about the art. I answered questions about how we care for the art at our museum and um, things of that nature. A physical portfolio of your experiences, just find it, nothing complicated and a physical portfolio showing your hand skills. So that can be sewing, um, drawing, painting. I think a student recently brought in nail art because she does uh, acrylic nails. And so that was included in her portfolio because that showed her hand skills. That's a very small area to be working on to make such beautiful work. So that really showed that she had the fine motor skills. And expect to have your color matching tested if you can't you're colorblind, I'm sorry, you can't come to conservation. Um, <laughs> you have to be able to see the difference between colors because we do a lot of in painting of works. So if you can't see the color very well, it's, it's very hard to get that to match. To ask and be asked questions, uh, you are interviewing the schools just as much as they're interviewing you. And uh, to meet the current students in a relaxed environment, once you are there, they try to bring you into an environment where you can meet the students in a space that's not the school so you can ask questions of them that you didn't feel comfortable asking of the staff and faculty or other things that you expect a student to know and not necessarily faculty, like where the good bars are, <laughs> which is important. So um, the general coursework of Buffalo, uh, which is where I went to my line include, uh, Shannon can talk more about the Delaware program if anyone's interested in knowing that specific at this point. <clears throat> so the Delaware Buffalo program, almost like the Buffalo program is three years. Um, the third year is an off-site year. So the first two years in Buffalo, you learn all of the specialties. So you spend time learning how to work on paper, books, paintings, objects, um, photographs, textiles, and we are as the field is evolving. Time-based media is coming up more and more often. Artists are using digital materials in their work or making only digital works. And so we're having to incorporate understanding technology and time-based media more into the curriculum. curriculum. And so we're trying to bring that more into all of the programs so that way everyone's prepared to deal with these works. Because depending on which museum you are, they may be classified in different areas or depending on what the artist has classified. And then we do a research and technology project just to better understand the process of how something was made. Um, it could be anything that you're interested in within limits. Um, I know one of the students right now is tanning a goat skin to understand how leathers from goat are made. So she's doing all the different processes that would have been used traditionally to tan goat skins because she's interested in that material. So it's really just whatever you're interested in. And then your second year, you moved into your specialty, and you focus more on that and uh, do a thesis project based on your own interests and what you would like to treat. So, for example, sorry, for example, I did a diorama from Tuskegee. I was very interested in treating them. I wanted to be a part of that project, and so that was my thesis project. And Caitlin, uh, who's my my classmate, worked on a. Uh, instrument that came from Africa because she was very interested in ancient and modern as well, but mainly ancient instruments and how they work and their care and 
what conservation treatments are practical for those and respectful of their original use and origins. And then your third year, you're off site. That can be either with a museum or a private conservator or um, split between both. So um, I think of my classmates, three were, were with private conservators for at least a part of their time. Um, it just depends on where you are in the country. A lot of the museums are focused in the Northeast, so if you would like to not live in the Northeast, you do often have to go private practice and own your own business, um, which is also something that people may just want to do in general. <coughs> so now to a, a more fun part of the presentation, it's not just how to do it, but things that I did in graduate school. So my first summer, and every summer you had the option of doing an internship. It is not necessarily required, but it's very much encouraged, and it's something that is very um, meaningful and fulfilling. So my first summer, I was at the Mississippi Museum of Civil Rights and Museum of Mississippi History, which just opened in 2018, 17, 2017. And there, I was able to treat artifacts that are related to um, both museums, they are two separate museums, but they share a building. And so I treated a Civil War um, Confederate dumbbell. And one of the lanterns that was at the meeting in which it was decided that Alabama and Mississippi could not join the Union as one territory, that they needed to be two separate states. And then in 2017, um, I helped update the Buffalo Realm, which is just a handy um, handbook that we make by students, for the students of where to find things in Buffalo, because you do have to move to graduate school, and so it's often very hard to know where to find a mechanic, where to find the most closest grocery store if you need something dry cleaned. You just moved here, so we make that list for um, the incoming students to know where things are that work for the other students and are at a reasonable price. However, um, Buffalo is, I'm only the third black student to go through the Buffalo program, and the one before me went through in 1999. So the room was created after she went through the school. So there were some things that were not in the room that I needed, like where's the beauty store? We had Sally's listed, and Sally's is not a beauty store. <laughs> it is a nail shop. And uh, where to find a beauty shop, and where to find, um, a, I also include where to find a barber, because I like my kitchen cleaned up, and I didn't know where to find a barber that knew what to do with my hair. <laughs> and so I added that to the room, so that way the students after me would have that information, so that way they wouldn't have to go out seeking and trying to find that information in a new city. And then myself and other classmates drafted an open letter to our faculty and staff requesting the department take a firmer stance on diversity and um, inclusion. And we incorporated that open letter into our website and into the uh, application materials. So now in your written statement, you have to address how you feel about that and what you plan to do in your working practices to be culturally sensitive. We often treat, particularly in objects, um, we treat things that are not from our culture, and so we may not always understand everything around it. We do our research, but often you just don't understand because you don't know it's not yours. So getting that, that thought process even started to be sensitive to where this comes from and its history is something that we wanted students to address before they even made it into the programs. And then I pushed for participating in diversity and uh, cultural sensitivity training with Dr. Carol McFarlane, who works with all the graduate schools on uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, again, conservation is not a very diverse field. We are working to change that, but when there's change, there's often mistakes that happen, so we are trying to limit those as much as possible and make sure that we learn from them as the field changes. And then back to pictures. So 
So in 2018, I did a summer internship at the Brooklyn Museum in Brooklyn, New York. And there, I got to work with lasers to treat art objects. Uh, they have, yeah, they have a dozen of these Assyrian reliefs that came from the palace of King Ashurnasher Paul II. And they were installed in the 1950s when the rules around art were a little more lax. So they are attached to the wall with plaster and uh, mortar, which is inappropriate because if there's ever an uh, earthquake in New York City, these will fall off the wall because the plaster is not prepared to hold on to that. Each one is about a ton, so if that happens, then away they go. Hopefully there's no people in the way. But right now, they're working with Bank of America to remove them from the wall, put them on a much more safe and movable support system, and remove the mortar and plaster from the front surfaces. Because it was just kind of slapped over the front, and then if it covers something, they just painted it to make it match. But when you know better, you do better. And then while I was there, I got a visit from my classmates from Texas Southern. And if uh, anyone knows John Biggers, who started the art department at Texas Southern, this is a sketch at Brooklyn Museum of a mural that we have at Texas Southern. Uh, it's called The Web of Life, and it is, I want to say, eight feet tall and 30 feet long. So it was really nice to go to an institution and see materials related to my school and then get my classmates to come visit while they were completing their Masters of Fine Arts. And then uh, 2018 through 19 was the beginning of, was my third year experience. And I did that at the St. Louis Art Museum. This doesn't exactly look the coolest, but uh, it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. So the circle in the middle of that street, which isn't all that impressive looking, is a sculpture that we had to embed in the road, which I hope to never do again, because that was the main way to cut through the park to get to the highways. The city hated us for three months because they could not come through, but we installed this work. And it was really fun working on it. I got to use dry ice to clean it and then uh, to make sure it didn't flash rust, in which it's uh, wet and cold for long enough that it can rust very quickly, and then you have to start your cleaning process over, which we didn't want to do. Um, I was, we had to use blow torches to make sure it was dry enough to make sure you get rust. So that was kind of fun to do. And then I did a 20-day option, which at Buffalo, it's, you have the option of taking a month out of your third year to go to another institution and do research or work there. So I um, was given the opportunity to work at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures which should be opening soon, and we'll have um, anything related to films on display that has uh, been part of the Academy's collection. So I worked on a gremlin from 1984's Gremlins, and uh, the stunt-worn alien head from 1979's Alien, the original head is uh, lost. But I got the stunt-worn, so that was good enough. And then I graduated in 2019, and that's Caitlin with a nice big smile. <laughs> and then um, I know art conservation isn't for everyone. It's one of those fields where you really have to love it to pursue it because it is a lot. There's a lot of things that have to happen before you get to school, and then you have to make it through school, and then you have to start your career from there. So if it's not for you, that's perfectly fine. My feelings will not be hurt. I just want to offer advice that works for any discipline um, because I feel like these are very important things that I kind of missed out on before um, before I really got to my undergraduate and I, I think that they, if I had them earlier they would have carried me much further. But I'll give it to you now. Be your best advocate. You know what's best for you. You know what you need. Say something. Um, I took an internship at the National Museum of African Art, and it was an unpaid internship in Washington, D.C., and I am not from a rich family. <laughs> so I emailed the director to say, have I missed out on any funding opportunities? Is there a job that you know of that will allow me enough flexibility to come at least two to three times a week, but still be able to pay my rent? And they were able to find funding that I could use because I told them I needed it. 
Otherwise, I would have been trying to figure out how to pay rent in an expensive city without funding. So say something, and people will help you if you say something. Start master copies of your CV and your resume. Every time you win an award or start a new job, just add it to it and keep it going so that way anytime there's an opportunity that's short notice, you don't have to waste time trying to format your, your resume. It's already together, it's already there, and then you can copy and paste what you need for that specific job from your master copy. So that way it makes it a lot easier for um, opportunities that are short notice. Where my first internship for the Smithsonian, I didn't find it until five days before it was due. So if I would have had to put my resume together, I don't think I would have got the application in on time. So having that master copy made it much simpler and quicker, and often opportunities come up where you have to move quickly. So you want to make it as simple as possible for yourself to do that. Or you don't want to forget what you've done so that way it's already there, you already have record of it, you're not going to forget what opportunities you've already had, what awards you've already won. Just trying to think back to a job three years ago about what your duties were, it's kind of difficult. And then lastly, don't pre-reject yourself from opportunities. So if it says that it's for a doctoral student, obviously don't apply, but if it's saying that you need five years of experience and you only have two to three, apply anyway. Because often they will overlook the fact that you may not have enough experience if your other qualifications aren't enough. Or if they feel like you can learn what you need to learn on the job for that position. Mm -hmm. And then if you are rejected, don't be discouraged. It takes time. Maybe that opportunity was already thought of for someone else and they're going through an interview process because they have to, just ask for information on how to make your application stronger, and very often uh, opportunities will give you that information of why they didn't choose you or what they think you need to grow on. So that's all I've got for now. Um, thank you everyone who made this day possible and uh, who are funding everything that had to happen for this to be an option. Studio art, those are the courses that you have to take 
in order to get into graduate school, and of course ethics. Everything that we do is guided by ethics. But I feel like it's really more like this uh, when it comes to three-legged stool because it's not just those three um, disciplines and ethics. There's also other things that we are responsible for in our professional work, which is preventive conservation. So a lot of times, because the field is so small and um, there are a lot of jobs really uh, heavily concentrated on the coasts, but sometimes you might find yourself in the Midwest or somewhere else in the Southeast, and you might find yourself being the only conservator and maybe the conservator and the collections manager caring for an entire collection. So you have to know preventive conservation, which is caring for an entire collection and this more holistic uh, preservation of materials, not just individual treatments. Of course, we also do a lot of outreach and advocacy. We're constantly doing outreach like such as this or even you know advocating for our field for better pay, more jobs, that type of thing. And then professional development, I think there's in any career you go into, you're, you're going to constantly have to be developing yourself professionally and growing as a profession. So that's something that we're always doing. And then, of course, other duties as required. Um, that could be anything. Um, but a lot of times we find ourselves mentoring or teaching, uh, which I, that's something that I really value and enjoy and have gotten an opportunity to do a lot of in my career. Um, so just a little bit about my journey. So I uh, graduated from Spelman in 2009, and I discovered conservation uh, kind of midway through my matriculation here at Spelman. I started out as a, a biology major, thinking I would go into medical school. I was really interested in forensics. And then um, between my uh, sophomore and junior year, I took uh, an art class just because to fulfill the prerequisites and uh, that we had to do for for you know, general education. And I realized, I was like, oh wow, I, I really like drawing, I really like art. I, I had always been involved in art when I was in high school. I took a theater and dance and all that, and, and I did do some visual art classes in high school, but I, 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 I guess I had just pushed it to the side a little bit, thinking I'm gonna go to medicine, this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be able to you know, make my family proud. And, um, so I changed my major from bio to art, and um, to my parents' uh, chagrin. And uh, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do, but I still wanted to go to medical school. I still was interested in you know, art and science. I was like, there's a way, there has to be a way to combine art and science. And one of my professors, uh, who actually happened to be my art advisor, Dr. Akua McDaniel, um, learned about this program at the University of Delaware for as a summer program kind of focused on art, art history, art uh, conservation, and the humanities, arts and humanities summer institute. And she's like, you should apply for this. I've already written your letter of recommendation. All you have to do is send in your, uh, your information. So I did, and essentially the rest is history. And you know, now I, I found my way to conservation. Uh, I specialize in photographic paper conservation. And um, that's, that's essentially where I got my start. But um, between graduating from Spelman and getting into grad school, I still needed to get conservation hours. So as Lestarsha mentioned, you have to have this minimum of 400 conservation hours. But in reality, people apply with thousands of hours. So I, um, I did a number of internships. I volunteered. Um, but the bulk of my pre-conservation pre experience was done at the Smithsonian. I was at the National Museum of the American Indian for uh, an eight-month eight full-time internship. And um, I got a chance to work with these amazing collections, uh, of course, you know, with uh, Native American and indigenous, indigenous cultures. And then I, I also interned at the African Art Museum. And uh, it, was, it was unpaid. But uh, by that point, I already knew I was going into graduate school. So I started uh, grad school at the University of Delaware in 2012, um, thinking that I might consider paper or textile conservation or or photograph conservation and of course the way the programs are set up you have you rotate through the blocks so when we got to photograph conservation block I knew that I was like that's that's what I'm gonna do um, and so I uh, specialize in photography conservation I, I did my summer internships at I went back to NMAI and worked with the photo archives for my first summer I worked in a private practice conservation studio in Boston for my second summer and for my third year I went to the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona. 
And now, um, I am back at the Smithsonian. I, 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 when I graduated in 2015, I got a fellowship at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, um, looking at contemporary photography. And that spring of my fellowship year, a job posting came up at the Museum Conservation Institute, and it, they had never had, so the Smithsonian, despite it being so large, only has two photographic conservators on staff, including me. So this job was essentially like a brand new position. Um, they never had this type of position before, so I was like, oh my gosh, this is a dream come true. And as they say, the rest is history. So I, um, I selected photography conservation because I've always been fascinated by it. And I, I like to share this as part of my um, story because as with many people, photography is such a, a huge part of all of our lives. I mean, every day we probably take photographs. But when I was a kid, I used to spend so much time with my grandparents and uh, my great aunts. And so I had a chance to look at all of the family photographs. And I was just so fascinated by it, that how you could capture this image of someone from you know decades before, and you still have this image, and you can still see them, see who that person was, and what they looked like. So, and the other thing I like about it is uh, photography is considered a democratic art. It's very accessible. Um, you can, everybody has photographs, so it's not something that's really foreign to anyone. And you know, the, the holding a photograph in your hand is, is such a special moment. So it, I, I, I felt that that was even more of a reason to, uh, to be able to preserve those materials because they are so precious. When people have natural disasters or a fire in their homes, a lot of times, excluding human life, of course, but then they want to go back and get other photo albums. So that's, you know, that tells you a lot right there. So just to go on a little bit about how Spellman shaped me, as I mentioned, I did the Arts and Humanities Summer Institute in 2008. Um, in my senior year, I um, had to do a, an internship, um, like an inter a semester-long internship. So I did that at the uh, Emory University Michael Carlos Museum with Renee Stein. Um, I also had the opportunity to work at the Robert Woodruff Library as an archives assistant on uh, a photographic preservation project. And, um, and then I, I did the second round of the uh, Arts and Humanities Summer Institute at the University of Delaware, and of course, my graduation from Spelman with my BA in art. Um, another thing that I like to credit as part of my journey is when I was an art student, um, Dr. Arturo Lindsay taught a number of the, the art uh, history classes and he always talked about this concept of Ashe as an aesthetic criteria and Ashe being the life force that's in everything and so when I learned that I found it to be quite compelling to go along with this idea of preserving works of art and what you're preserving as part of that work of art you're preserving that context you're preserving that artist's intent you're preserving you know the tool marks you're preserving those things that are tangible but also intangible and I found that to be quite transformative and it, it really aligned well with the path that I felt like I was embarking on at that time because so I wasn't sure you know I didn't know what was going to become of me if I did art conservation. I had no idea you know I didn't know any other African-American conservators I you know there were just a few conservators in the south so it's just like I, I didn't have a lot of examples to look to so I was like well this this has to mean something and so as part of my senior thesis, I, um, I wrote about um, Carrie Mae Waits' From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried, and of course, that's a photographic uh, body of work. And I became interested in, in um, Sojourner Truth's um, creation of her own image, <coughs> excuse me, and just how you can use photographs to tell these stories, but you also have these source images, these objects, these physical objects that um, tell so much as well. And then, so I'll just go into a little bit about my, what I do, um, paper, which is paper and photo conservation. Um, I always like to talk about paper being this uh, magical felted sheet of fibers that are laid down on a fine a screen from a water suspension because paper is essentially the most ubiquitous material in all of our lives. Um, it's everywhere. And uh, often we don't think about what it is, but because I work with it day in and day out, I'm constantly thinking about the materials and how it's made and, and how we preserve it for um, long-term and longevity. 
And I, I always like to show this gift of a hand paper, hand paper making studio in China uh, because it really illustrates how one goes in and you know all the physical nature of creating something such as paper, which now it's created by machines, but initially it was created by hand. Um, and then of course the, it's a fibrous material, so it's made up of different types of fibers. Uh, very good paper is made of cotton and, lin and linen fibers, and then you also have the more common paper is made of wood, fi wood pulp fibers. Um, and then the, the, the types of work that you can create from paper. Um, the four on the left are uh, from Smithsonian collections, and you can see the variety there. You have drawings, you have paintings, you have handwritten notes by James Baldwin. And I like to include this paper dress because it's not in our collection, but maybe one day it will be, but it's made out of paper. And someone wore this dress made out of paper. Um, and then of course photography, which is my heart. Um, it's, it's, it's a material that was made to evolve as a medium. So initially, you know, it's made on glass, paper, or film support, but now it can be an electronic chip or doesn't even have to come out of your computer or out of your phone. Um, but it was invented in the early 1840s, and most people who have done darkroom photography know what the magic of creating a photograph is like. And um, just to share some of these beautiful images from the Smithsonian collections, uh, we have these lovely daguerreotype images uh, you know, of, of people who never would have imagined that their image would still be around and still have such a, a great impact on, on people today. Um, but I, I also like to show the diversity of the medium because you have something that's created on a metal support uh, with silver, mercury, and gold, and then you have something such as the cyanotype here that's created on a paper support using an iron-based process. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't share a little bit about um, the practicalities of working as a paper and photograph conservator. So constantly thinking about what these materials are vulnerable to. Um, they're just like humans. They're vulnerable to you know the things that we we all try to stay away from. You know, high heat, relative humidity, pests, water damage, pollution, light, and acidity. But of course, mishandling and inherent vice. These objects were meant to be used and shared. So sometimes they are mishandled or they're not stored properly. And these are some of the effects that you can see um, from that type of damage. Um, but. As a conservator, I have an opportunity to help mitigate some of those issues, either through interventive conservation treatments, such as immersion washing a photograph to remove degradation products or remove a, an unstable um, uh, attachment, or doing uh, loss compensation through in painting on this uh, early, excuse me, 20th century crayon portrait. We also do collection surveys and rehousing, so not just um, this is going back to the preventive conservation where you're doing more um, holistic collections care. So not necessarily doing treatments, but doing something that will prevent or mitigate future damage because you can't necessarily treat every single object. So we have this collection of Edward Moybridge's uh, animal locomotion um, glass plate interpositives at the National Museum of American History. And we're currently working on a collection survey to, to figure out how to um, best rehouse them to make them more accessible to visitors. Um, as well as something such as a tent type, which is a photograph on um, an iron support. Iron is a very uh, unstable material, as I sorry, just talked about. It's a very unstable material, and it will rust. So if it doesn't have a proper enclosure, that can eventually you'll have to see damage on, on something like that. And then, a lot of my work, since I am at a research facility, we do a scientific analysis and research. And all of this informs how we care for the, uh, the works of art, either how for treatment or display um, or storage. And so I've been working on this long-term project, um, looking at the color, uh, light sensitivity of color photographs. So taking color readings before something goes out on exhibition to set a baseline for what the color is supposed to be or what the color was when, before it went out on exhibition and then taking readings after it comes off exhibition to see if there's a change. Um, as well as looking at materials, so this object that I have on this image is a, a photographic quilt and um, 
it's, it's rather large, so we have to examine it in sections. And we wanted to under, better understand the printing technique that the artists use, so using a, a, an optical microscope to do that. And then, of course, preparing objects for exhibition. So I had the, the wonderful opportunity to, to work with two um, signed documents, uh, the 13th Amendment and the Emancipation Proclamation, two original signed uh, Abraham Lincoln documents uh, for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we were preparing them to go into this uh, specialized exhibition case that would monitor and maintain a specific relative humidity and temperature. And we had to do all of this imaging and, and uh, preparation before they could go into those cases. And so I, I had a chance to work with a number of colleagues and interns to prepare these objects to go on view. And they're now on view in the uh, Slave Night Freedom Gallery. And I would like to thank, um, again, thank you all for having me here. And thank everyone on the, the list on the screen. Um, and thank you for your attention. Shannon and Ms. Darsha, I think what we'd like to do with the time remaining um, is to open the floor for uh, questions, but also uh, I think before we do that, if there's anything that the two of you wanted to discuss um, uh, amongst yourselves regarding your, your journey to um, to the field and, and the time that you've spent it in the field itself, um, that might be something that I think we'd all be interested in you knowing it. I'm thinking about part of the conversation yeah. we were having yesterday. Absolutely. So I guess I can start by saying that uh, since being in the field for a little over a decade now, which is hard to believe, um, I've seen dramatic changes in just the diversity and inclusion. I mean, it's not, again, it's not perfect, but even just within the last few years, um, I think it's, it's, it's getting better. And there are a number of efforts trying to make this field a, a bit more diverse and a bit more equitable. And having seen multiple iterations, even my short time in the field, of that and of that type of an initiative, I think we're at finally reaching a good, successful point where things are happening and people are feeling like they have a place in this field and they can come into this field. So I think it's a really good time to pursue conservation. Um, but again, last night we were talking about the number of African American conservators in the field, and you can count them on essentially two hands and one finger. So that's still a problem, um, and we know all of those conservators, eleven of us. Yeah. And yeah, and it's grown by a number of us in the last four or five years. Yeah, in the last four or five years, yeah. I think it went from five to eleven. Yeah. So, so we still have a lot of work to do, but we are, I feel hopeful about it, and I feel that we're, we're moving towards a good, um, at least the doors are being opened, because that's part of the, the challenge, is getting the doors open. A lot of the field is starting to understand that the issues that are, that are preventing it are systemic. And so it's not that someone's out there acting as a gatekeeper and saying that diversity can't come in. It's just realizing that some of the practices that have been in place in the, in the field for decades don't work anymore. Where a lot of times people were working unpaid for graduate school. And if you do not have family support, it is very difficult to get enough hours and still be able to do everything that you need to do with your life. And so the field is working towards eliminating unpaid internships. So that way, if you do take an, an opportunity, you don't have to weigh that opportunity versus paying your bills. And living, especially um, if you take one at an institution, a lot of them are in the Northeast, and a lot of those cities are incredibly expensive if you're there for a short time period. And often the, the opportunities are for the summer. And it's hard to find housing that you can afford in that time frame and still be able to, to really grow and really immerse yourself in your internship without having to worry about everything that needs to go on outside of it. So a lot of the institutions are seeking funding um, or finding funding within their own institutions to cover interns, um, 
particularly if they come from an uh, underrepresented background. So that way the field does get that information into the field and we can really expand what conservation is to be more inclusive. Well, Starship, if I could just add something to that, um, and this is a plug, uh, but we do offer uh, uh, funding for art history majors and curatorial studies minors um, for summer internships. And so um, I think I would like to pose a question, and that is, um, I was really fascinated by um, the, the trajectory that each of you ha has taken to get to where you are in your fields, and especially um, the starship in your presentation, how you showed very methodically and meticulously the steps that you had to take um, and how you were inspired uh, to do what you did and what one has to do in order to, um, to apply for graduate school. And so for our students and for our own edification, I'm curious about how do you go about getting those hours that you need and, and sort of the, the paper that you need uh, to show that this is my portfolio, this is the album that I worked on, or this is what I've done. So if we could, say, at the AUC Art Collective, find internships, summer internships, that we would be able to fund so that you would be paid, that your rent would be paid, and that you would not be working um, essentially for free uh, to be able to pursue conservation for an eight to 10 week period. Um, how would someone go about looking for something like that and, and connecting to find an internship? Um, well, my first internship was on my on campus at Texas Southern. So um, I was able to work with the um, Harlem Museum, uh, uh, Harlem School of Dance and the Harlem Ballet. They came to Texas Southern to do an exhibit and I was able to work as their exhibit assistant and do some textile conservation. Um, part of textile conservation is making sure that the textile is going to be safe on display and that it's safe on its mount. And so that often doesn't involve sewing the uh, piece to its mount so that way it can't slide down or can't be taken off without removing those stitches. And since I did have experience with sewing before, um, I was able to do that and really help that exhibit because we only had uh, the small staff that we had. But in terms of finding internships, I really recommend looking at the Delaware website. They update their internships very frequently, as well as the uh, AIC website. This is Winterthur, right? Right. Um, sorry. Artcons.udel.edu. Right. And then um, the AIC website um, often updates what internships are available and we're trying to push for them to include whether those opportunities are paid or not. Um, there are some legal issues with the uh, organization requesting that, but I'm working as well as other people are working to make sure that it's listed if that's a paid opportunity or not, but that's uh, culturalheritage.org and on the member boards, and you can be a member of the uh, website without paying a membership fee, but you can, um, see what opportunities are being posted and know if there's anything near you or um, I have to just look at the website for museums in the area that I'm trying to be. They will often say if they have a conservation department and if there are opportunities through that field. Or um, my first internship outside of Texas Southern was at the Cleveland Museum of Art and that was technically a curatorial internship, but I applied in my application materials, let them know very much that I was interested in conservation. So although I was doing curatorial work, I worked very heavily with conservation, and we did tours. I made a tour for their application, um, which you use through iPads that you can borrow from the institution, about conservation in their collection, you can go on a self-guided tour to learn more about what has been conserved in their, uh, their collection, and then a second tour about what things were found in conservation uh, through different analytical methods. So they have a Picasso painting when, uh, that they found once they x-rayed it that originally was a self-portrait, but he painted over his own face with one of his friends that had passed. And so it was very interesting to see that he did 
make sure this is where we can find the, the information for that for next year. Um, so I would recommend just kind of, or just calling. I often call institutions and see if they have opportunities, because sometimes they don't think there's a student interested. And so if you just let them know sometimes that you are interested, they will tell you if their institution has something, or maybe direct you to a different institution or a private conservative area. Absolutely, and I, just to add to that, um, the Smithsonian, of course, has a website that lists all of the opportunities, but the best way to find out uh, is to either call or email someone directly. I've gotten a number of uh, people just cold email me and ask me, introduce themselves and say they're really interested in conservation, they um, you know, are trying to get experience, and uh, sometimes we're able to take on interns if we have a project that's going on, but a lot of times, you know, where we, they, you just email the person. And especially if you have your own funding, it might be helpful to add into that, like, you know, I'm, I'm a student, we have funding to support this, that could, that could help too, because a lot of times institutions are hesitant to take an intern if they don't have funding. And that unfortunately happens more often than not because they can't pay you, they don't want you to work for free, but you still need to get experience. And so even when I was a pre-program, I um, took a, a volunteer position. It wasn't in conservation, it was in collections management at a museum because I knew you know, collections management is conservation adjacent. So I wanted to get this experience, but they flat out told me that they couldn't pay me. And I was able to do that, but it's not, it's not recommended and it's not um, necessarily something that a lot of institutions will do because it isn't right to take someone on in an unpaid way. But if you have funding and that's available to you, then that is helpful to include in your, in your email or your phone call to that, to that person. So uh, if, if ever anybody's interested in learning about opportunities at the Smithsonian and you have a hard time figuring out what might be appropriate for you, you can just email me. I can give you my contact information, my business card. I'm happy to help in any way or with anything conservation related because it can be tough to navigate the field, uh, especially when you don't really know what the possibilities are. Thank you. There's just one question here. Um, building off of your comment about how hard it can be to navigate the field, I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about the role that mentorship may have played for you in your every program time. Um, if you each found a mentor or multiple mentors and how that helped launch your, your exploration. Absolutely, so I, I would not be here without the support of my mentors. Um, one of my mentors is sitting back there, Jada Harris, I'm sorry to call you out, but she was my supervisor when I was at the Woodruff Library working on the archives project, and she's been one of my biggest supporters throughout this entire uh, journey, uh, as well as my mentors that I met at the University of Delaware before I even knew I was gonna go into conservation. They, they provided me with the information, they connected me, they knew I was coming back to Spelman to finish my uh, matriculation through college, and they connected me with Renee Stein at the Carlos Museum so I could do the internship there um, during my uh, senior year. And then of course, other internship supervisors that I've had that are now colleagues at the Smithsonian, it's, it would not be possible without those people. I can't say that I've had positive experiences with everyone, but I find that when you have someone who um, is, supportive of you and is kind of helping to open the door for you, it's, it, it, it makes a huge difference. And then um, I very much would not have accomplished everything that I have without mentorship from Texas Southern. Um, I was very fortunate that uh, Alvia Wardlaw, who is the museum director and uh, art history professor, and she used to be a curator at Museum of Fine Arts Houston, um, she was took me under her wing and put up with a lot of my, my mess. Because I, I tend to find opportunities at the last minute, and so she would um, stop everything that she had going on to make sure that she could get a lot of recommendation in on time, and would read my application materials for things and make sure that everything was going well and that I was doing what she thought would present what I was wanting to do the best. Um, and then once I did get to the Smithsonian, a lot of my supervisors were incredibly helpful um, and reviewed my application materials to, for graduate school and sort of left breadcrumbs for me in a lot of ways for other opportunities where they couldn't 
directly tell me about things um, because the Smithsonian is a federal institution, so they can't always directly tell you that there's an opportunity that they would like you to apply for. But sometimes conversations would happen around me specifically to let me know that a contract was coming up, but they couldn't tell me that I needed to apply for a contract. They would just mention that it was coming, and then I could get my materials in place to apply for that contract, and that helped me stay in DC longer. Um, I was originally only supposed to be there for four months for a single internship, but I was there for almost two years working with different internships and contracts, which really helped me get into school because I had enough hours and I had hours where I could show the progression of a project from, from inception to completion instead of just saying, oh, I worked on this one thing for the summer, but someone else finished it. I could say, I started it this summer, and I, it took a year, I finished it this time, which I felt like really made my application to was strong. And uh, I, it really was, without them, I think I would have still been at home being built, but I think they were happy with my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do we have time for a, maybe one more question from the floor before we break for the next panel? Yes. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jasmine Wilson. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, there's so much with conservation, as you both have explained. Um, and I'm curious as to what are some of the more meaningful experiences that you had in your internships and fellowships? like? I know in the art industry, like it can be very challenging to kind of navigate the right spaces to get to the right places. Um, and sometimes it's contingent upon a certain name behind an institution or a certain mentor who's at an institution um, or even just certain programmatic uh, like opportunities, right? So what is your example or your idea or what in your experience has signified like a good conservation experience that really got you to this level to where you're working now? Like what what made that difference in you making it in the industry? Um, I think for me it was just applying for things and taking a chance because so when I was a fellow uh, at the Hirshhorn this position that I'm in now came up and the way it was posted it was posted as such that anybody who had expertise in photograph conservation and had at least been, you know, postgraduate a year could apply. But because jobs are so scarce and so few and far between, um, I was like, well, maybe, you know, I, I might not be able to get that, but not pre rejecting myself and recognizing, you know, I had all of this experience having been at the Smithsonian as an intern and multiple times and then as a fellow and that could help bolster my application. So I think if you have an idea of the type of institution that you want to work in or work for, strategically aligning yourself with that institution could help. Um, I don't know, I mean, yes, I have experience and expertise, but I, I also knew the institution well. And I think that could have made me a stronger candidate in the collaborative work that we do at my unit because we work with all of the museums. So just kind of, putting in my mind, like, I want to be in this type of place and really working towards that uh, could be. Um, conservation is a lot like other fields where it builds off previous experience that you've already had. So I would say uh, my first experience at Texas Southern. So we have historic murals on campus. It's part of our graduation requirements if you want to be an art major that you have to complete a mural. and they can be on campus or they can be elsewhere, but most people have chosen to do them on campus. And one of our former presidents had some of those mirrors painted over because he thought they were eyesores. And so he brought in an outside conservation firm to do a survey of all the paintings on the walls and better understand their condition and understand what could and could not be saved. And the historic blueprints had not been updated in decades. So things that used to be hallways were now conference rooms and offices. So I was one of the few students that knew where all the murals were. So it was my job to take them around and show them where all the murals were, give them access to different people's offices. And once I started seeing what they were doing in conservation and understanding that that was something I wanted to pursue, I borrowed a lab coat and a clipboard and 
told everyone I was their intern and would answer the top five most frequently asked questions because I, I memorized the answer from what they were saying until the point that they finally said, do you want to be our intern and actually do work? And I was like, yes, I would love to. And that was my first conservation experience. So then when I was applying for other ones, I could say I've, I've already done hands-on conservation. I may not have worked on that specific material before, but I, I have an understanding of how to work in conservation, so I could learn from your opportunity and then apply that to everything going forward. So I think just like kind of wiggling yourself in there on that, that first opportunity, so that way you can use that as your building blocks towards what's coming next. Wonderful. So I'd like to ask everyone to please join me in thanking Shannon and the Star Show. chance to meet your neighbors um, at your own tables and maybe at another table. So um, this is really a, a way for us to not only introduce uh, the field of conservation here at the AUC, but also for, uh, for us all to be able to make new friends and to network. And I just had the opportunity to meet uh, Sigourney um, Smuts, who's just there raising her hand. And she's at the um, the Georgia State Archives, yes. Georgia State Archives, um, and she's just told me about a, a paper conservation preservation workshop series that's taking place later um, this spring uh, in, in March. So um, she'll speak about that a little bit later, but there are really a lot of great opportunities just to get to know people here who are um, really dedicated to this field. I also wanted to just um, point out that um, out front, there are a number of, of flyers. Um, there's the Quick Start Guide, uh, a career in art conservation, the ABCs of art conservation. And this is uh, something from the AIC and the ECPN. Um, oops. So you know, make sure you pick this up if it's something that, that interests you. And there are other uh, materials from these organizations that can help to guide you 
um, if you're interested in even um, a business card here as well, something small that you can take about conservation and so on. Um, so this is really something that's designed to get us all fully immersed um, in the field. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that Renee Stein, um, again, who was really responsible for putting us all together, um, has joined us uh, just there in the, the back of the room. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out, Renee, um, and also bringing all of your colleagues here. I also wanted to acknowledge that um, Dr. Webb Bender's uh, Mining the Museum class has just entered the room as well. And, I think they're all kind of sitting around uh, in different uh, tables here, but this is Dr. Webb Bender at the, at the, at the front uh, of the room. And then Dr. Asper, who's also teaching here at uh, Spelman College um, in our program in Art History and Curatorial Studies, the Intro to the Object uh, class she's teaching, and also the Black Female Body. Um, she's here, too. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, please. Huh. Okay, good. All right. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our next panel. This is a session two, Consequences, Conservation, and the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, featuring Ann Collins Smith, um, who is a Spelman alumna uh, herself from the class of 1996. She is the curator of collections at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. And um, in this panel, uh, together with Lestarsha and McGarrity, again, please refer to um, the program for the extended bios. They're going to be discussing uh, two works from the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art around this, this, um, this general theme of, of the consequences, I think, of conservation. Uh, one work is a work by Romir Bearden, his guitar executive from 1967. It's a mixed media collage and also one of the quilts um, from the Quilters of G's Bend. So without further ado, we welcome you up here uh, to the panel. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So, uh, hi everybody. It's so great to see so many people in the room. I'm gonna try not to get excited because that's not good for my heart rate, but I love this stuff <laughs> right now. Um, only temporarily, but I'm gonna give you an overview of how conservation has informed uh, my curatorial practice at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. When I was a student yesterday, um, um, art was distributed throughout the campus. And so when the Cosby Building was being built, the Camille Cosby Building was being built, there was a stipulation that a fine art museum was to be established. So I was on the crew in 1995 to go throughout the um, campus and um, do an assessment of the art that was on campus. And so I got to see what was really in the Spelman College collection. The Elizabeth Catlett was an Elizabeth Catlett concourse in LLC one. So art, we were supposed to be living with art, but of course, you know, that could be detrimental if we don't know how to care for the works, right? So one of the works that we um, cataloged was this Romare Beard, and the name of it is Guitar Executive. This is how it looked I guess when it was its most pristine, and this is how it looks now. So what are the differences that you see? Fading. Fading, mm-hmm. Fading. So do you know what caused that fading? Sunlight. Sunlight. So this work was hanging in an administrator's office. We will not out that person in direct sunlight, right? So this is way before my time, really. And so now I ask um, Lestarsha, I say, so what can we do and what did you say? Well, when things have faded, particularly blue, um, it's very fugitive, which just means when it's subjected to light exposure for too long, it often disappears um, or darkens often kind of darkens to a brown, but a lot of times it just disappears entirely, where you lose that color and there's really nothing we can do to bring it back. Um, so now with the piece in the condition that it's in, it's all about how you exhibit it and understanding that every time you exhibit it, you're exposing it to light. So to make sure that when you do exhibit it, you keep it under certain light conditions so that way it's not getting direct sunlight, it's not getting a lot of light. And then when it is in storage, making sure that it's being stored in the dark, um, so that way it's not being subjected to more light exposure and losing more of the pigment that's there. And um, 
just really understanding what you have now and preserving what you can. Um, some, some museums have been experimenting with different light sources to make it look like that blue is still present um, by doing a slightly bluer light so we can see what it could have looked like. Um, but really at this point, once you've started to fade, you just have to kind of accept what has been lost. So there was also a conversation about doing a surrogate. What would be a surrogate, and what would we want to do that? Or yeah. So with particularly with paper objects, um, either a surrogate or a facsimile is often a print of that work. So you take a really um, good image of it with digital photography, and you reprint that, and you note it clearly on the um, tombstone, which is just the label next to it, that it is a facsimile so that way the original can stay in a safe location um, and then some institutions have been playing with the idea of editing that image to make the blues the correct color again so that way you can see what it did look like and you compare those colors to the um, original documentation to make sure that it looks the same and then putting that out on display and letting people understand that the original is being kept in storage for its own safety but that this is what it looked like, here's what it was, so that way people can have that information and be able to enjoy the work for a longer period of time without continuing to degrade the work. The college was a recipient of the bequest of the work of Selma Burke, and there's a work that she created called Uplift, and it was a public kind of monument piece. She created about 10 of those, right? And so one day there are some young kids on campus and um, one student ran into the work and kind of destroyed it. There are 10 of them though. There are 10 of them all throughout the United States. We are still looking for the mold. But someone here said, oh, I can conserve it. I can, you know, bronze it and do this. And so why is that really not in the commandments of conservation? Right. So the conservation is guided by a code of ethics where we, um, we make sure not to be too invasive to the works and we make sure that what we do is retreatable. So a lot of our documentation says reversible, but a lot of the things we do are not reversible. If I dust something, I cannot put that dust back. But someone who comes behind me can treat that work again and remove new dust that is accumulated or um, undo a stitch that I have done. So it's not that I can make the, the stitch never had happened, but I can undo it. So that way that piece uh, can live on longer than if we had left it alone. So to bronze a piece that is not originally in bronze is inappropriate. We would not do that um, unless the artist requested. Now if the artist says, I would like this piece to be redone in bronze, then that's the artist's decision. It is their work. They can make that decision. We are not the artist. We never want to act as the artist. If Even if we think a work could be improved, we don't do that. We only work with what the artist did, and we do our best to stick to their original materials and their intent as much as we possibly can. And if we can't, then we make sure what we have done can be undone later in the future. Thank you. So in 2004, we began, the museum with the art department began to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the art department. So part of that was um, looking at the works that we had by the founders of the art department, those are Hale uh, Espacio Woodruff and Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. And so we embarked on this um, exhibition project um, and it culminated in an exhibition entitled Hale Woodruff, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet and the Academy in 2006. We received a significant grant from the Getty Foundation, from the Henry Luce Foundation for American Art to conserve works in our collection so that we could present it and for it to be available for generations to come. And so, one of the works, so about the campus distribution too. So when the museum opened, everything that could be, it was exhibition kind of ready, was accessioned into the Museum of Fine Art and to the collection, so formally accession, given an accession number. But also, you know where the first floor of the um, Innovation Lab is? That was the art storage for the college. 
And so we were cleaning out the space, and so we found more paintings. This is one of the paintings. Um, and the windows were open, so they were you know, left to environmental issues. So this is a work that is by Hale Woodruff. The name of it is entitled Matador, as you can see. It was a gift from E.T. Williams, who's a collector um, out of New York. And um, so when we found this work, it was in the condition on the left and it had been obviously cut and it was a part of a mural. And we're still trying to figure out what this work is about. So that was one of the great finds. We also did not have any works by Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, who was a founder of the, one of the founders of the art department who attended the Rhode Island College um, School of Design and um, kind of left Spelman very prematurely because she didn't fit in with the culture of Atlanta. We thought we didn't have any works by her, but going back into that storage area, we found this watercolor, which was given to us by a former Spelman student. And we believe that this watercolor is what um, the physical plan is at Spelman. So you know where FMS works? This is where, this used to be um, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet's studio. So we had this work conserved too. And this is its verso on the back. So it was cleaned. Another work we found in storage, it's called The Village by um, Hale Woodruff, who spent a lot of time um, in Mexico with the Mexican muralists. This work was also on view in Rising Up, the um, Hale's Wood, Hale Woodruff's murals at Talladega College, which they're now back. The um, Amistad murals are now back at Talladega in their new facility. And so, as we thought we didn't have a Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, we, exist, we exhibited all the works that were existing of hers in the 75th anniversary exhibition. And we wanted to make it right, meaning that we wanted to acquire a work by someone who was seminal to the development of the art department at Spelman. So there was only one work available. And so the work that was available was Head and Ebony. So do you have any questions about this work? Where is the nose? Huh. So, we are of the idea that the artist destroyed it herself. She was frustrated. There are a lot of materials on her mental well-being. This is a woman who um, was very well educated but wasn't very well respected in the field, right? And it was hard for her, growing up in Rhode Island, it was hard for her to be in an all African American environment, although she was African American. And so um, she didn't get the respect her peers got. She didn't get the respect that Woodruff got. You know, one of the things, if you look into the archives, you don't really see them really interacting while they were here. And this woman had a degree whereby Woodruff didn't, but still. You know, he was given more um, opportunity than she was. So, yeah, she, she, she destroyed a lot of her works. There are probably nine or ten of her works existing. I saw one at the Brooklyn Museum, which I didn't know about, that went very, um, well, very bon marché in, um, in an auction about five or six years ago. If I had known about it, we would have bought it. So why would we purchase a work that looks like something's happened to it. There's context to her life and also like her artist practice. Mm -hmm. Do you see it as damaged? How do you view it? Um, I think it's like, it's layered, it's packed with, like even the story about like her mental health and there being like documents that kind of um, like document her mental health and then thinking about the context of the time, how she felt like she might not have been as valued as like a black male artist. And I think that all those things go into the work and the history of the work, which is why I appreciate museums. It also gives it an added dimension too. 
But what conservation say about us um, acquiring this work, and, this work and putting it on view? Are we sensationalizing or are we just curious? I think it would vary depending on the conservator that you've asked, but I personally think that if I were asked if the museum should acquire this, I would say yes. Because I think it honors her legacy and really understands the context around her work. And if I were at a museum where I could be involved in the exhibition, I would show the image of what it looked like before mm -hmm. she um, altered it to say this is what the piece originally looked like. And then the artist, in her frustrations and in her struggles as an artist and as, uh, as a woman during that time, chose to damage her work in this way. And this is what we have now. It's a testament to her skill. And it's also a testament to her life and her working practices. So I think that while some people would prefer the original, I prefer to see the, the history of works. I, mm -hmm. I like working at history museums and getting the story that comes with pieces and getting the story of what that, that object or that item survived and can act as document to. So I think that I would very much recommend uh, collecting it because it does do all of those things. You can see her, her skill and you can see all of the context around that skill in the same work. Thank you, and it's really, really, really gorgeous. I would love to show it to you um, sometime at a later date. All right, so current issues in conservation that we will have to monitor throughout um, its life. We acquired this work in 2016. Um, this is by Vanessa German, who creates these power figures, almost like the Enkisis. Um, the name of this work is called Delia on a Plain or Cabbage Slicer. On the front, on the cabbage slicer, there's an image of Delia. Delia's face has come, or her image has come into um, the news lately because her relatives have said that Harvard, you know, has used her images for their um, for their um, economic gain, and the family had no choice. But this work is made out of plaster in Paris, and so every time this work is handled, you see the little edges coming off, right? This is a contemporary work made in 2011. How do we ensure that this work is here for future generations? Okay, thank you, Siri, for answering that question. <laughs> I know, Siri, what would, okay. But, um, Contemporary works, a lot of artists incorporate materials that they know are not stable in the way that they've used it mm -hmm. because they want that instability. Mm -hmm. They want that to be part of the work. And so with a piece like this where it is losing pieces every time it's being handled, it would be making sure that the way it's housed limits the amount of handling that needs to be done. So it would be in a box where you wouldn't have to physically grab the object to get it out of that box. It would be one that maybe folds flat when you remove the lid or is on a tray where you can remove that tray and not have to handle the object so that way you don't risk it as much um, in terms of losing the edge pieces. And then if this piece were to go out on loan to another institution, doing a condition survey every time to make sure that the pieces that are there are stable and if they're not asking that it not be sent out on loan or um, making sure that it's packed in a way that makes sure not to lose any more pieces. And when it comes back, um, doing another condition report to see if it lost anything during the transit to that other museum or an exhibition there. So a lot of it is doing careful looking and documentation to make sure that we're not uh, damaging the works by exhibiting them. And sort of sometimes having to tell uh, curators and other museums that a piece is not safe to travel over and suggesting that it just stays where it is and maybe offering a different piece in its place that is more stable. So knowing that there's this, um, this circle of care you know, to the artist, to the object, and to the, um, to the audience, um, what will we tell Vanessa German about, you know, how do we inform them about materials? Because Bearden used materials of the time. We can't, you know, really conserve that piece because we don't know which magazines he clipped out, what, you know, 
there all the time. So how will we inform an artist to create, you know, well, I mean, not that we will want to, but if an artist is interested in their works for being here for generations to come, what could we, um, what could we share with them? Um, there's a lot of conservation scientists in the field, and conservation scientists are just people that do analytical work for conservation. So they typically don't do any conservation work on um, objects themselves, but they do like material studies and really understanding artists' materials, how they behave, how they interact, and understanding the materials that we use to conserve those pieces. So a lot of the conservation scientists have been doing material studies on understanding what artists are using and how those things will degrade. Some artists are very particular about what they use, and if you tell them the pigment you're using is not going to be stable, they will say, I don't care, I want that pigment. And they will use it regardless of its stability. But often artists understand what they want their artwork to do over time and what they want it to look like. And if they want it to look exactly the same way that it did when it was painted, they will try to use the best materials that they have access to. So, um, and a lot of artists do contact museums to say, you know, do you have any recommendations for this? Or is there a paper that you think would be best to do what I want to do? And so just really having her, um, just having a conversation with artists about what their intent for their work is, what they think of long term for the work, because some artists do want the pieces to have a life. And when you have a life, at some point you do die. And some artists want that for their works. So they want the work to have an end point, um, regardless of what collectors want. So for example, there's an artist who has made um, concrete molds of people that are on beach. And where they're placed on that beach, and it's in the UK, the tide, when it comes in, completely submerges these works. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to get colonized by barnacles, and they're being affected by the salt water. And the city wants the works to, to stay stagnant because it's a tourist draw, but the artist wants the works to change in their environment. And so the compromise between the artist and the city is that the artist has given the city the molds, so that way when the pieces do reach the end of their life, they can be replaced by the same work from the same mold but be allowed to live that life cycle again. So it's very much dependent on what the artist's intent is and what idea, at least at this point in their career, they have for their works. Thank you. So the last work I would like to show you is somewhat of a showcase and tell. Last year, the museum received a gift of seven quotes um, from the women of G's Bend, the cultures of G's Bend, from the Sows Grown Deep Foundation. They vary in conditions and um, conservation needs and holiness. You know, you know, women from the um, I won't call them the guild. The women who created these get, um, quotes, you know, created quotes for what? For warmth. But you know, the art world has seen them as artworks, and so there are um, and they've used used materials, and so um, all of the materials and scraps that they had. So. Um, the question is, is how do we honor this work and how do we keep it here for generations to come? So we're going to open it up and just look at it. And then I didn't bring paper with me, but I need to kind of do a, a conditions assessment. So thank you for bringing her here, collective, because you know. <laughs> All right. So are there any questions while we're um, opening the quote? Yes, ma'am. So um, I was really interested when you were talking about um, either being original versus facsimiles, uh -huh. and it made me think about um, how some museums they value um, object-based learning versus experience-based learning. And so I wanted to know how does Bowman Museum feels about uh, exhibiting like facsimiles or even um, like retouched collages in the example of Bowman Museum. How do we feel about that? Well, like your stance on um, whether or not the object is all important or the experience from learning about the object. That's a hard question to ask. You know, I mean, the original, the primary source is always, if it's available, we'd like to have that, you know, 
the experience with it. Mm -hmm. um, there's something different about, you know, really being, as opposed to looking at a, you know, like for example, I mean, they're coming here, but the, um, the Obama portraits, you know, people did not care for the Obama portraits by looking, seeing them from the television, you know, from a computer, you know, from your, your, your device, your smart device. You see that in person, you're in tears, you know? So um, it's like, why is the skin great? And you understand because the skin, the way in which she does the grayscale, Amy Sherrill gives it so much more depth than just, you know, even using flesh tones, you know? So I would, I would actually say the first, and I think that contributes to the experience. So for me, they're kind of one and the same. So if you want to come up and look at the works with, I mean, look at, look at this quote with us, you're more than welcome. So one of the things we see kind of already is that there's kind of a stain on it already. So I don't know on somebody's bed, I think, you know, at one point, so yeah. Because this was, you know, um, um, you know, made from old fabrics and was used, was a utilitarian object that we brought into the art museum context. Um, we're looking at some losses, and if you want to come up closer, just see and examine it. And there's a great article I would suggest, um, um, I can share it with you. It's called Back to the Future from Bridget Cooks's um, Exhibiting Blackness, talking about technology. So, Please, everyone, don't be shy. Yeah, thank this you. This is a hands-on opportunity. Yeah. You can come see. Would you like a piece of paper? Or you said that you didn't have one. Oh, yeah, thank you. Would you be the 
transcriber. Yeah. I would appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
where it's very fine, it's not catching your eye in any way, and you can just completely look through it, but putting at least one, maybe two pieces all the way around, so that way it is completely encapsulated inside this other material, so you're not, you have a smooth surface to work with, and you're not just seeing the thread and all the stitching, because you would hate for someone um, walking by to not be paying attention in their bracelet to catch it and pull the thread, or um, someone to be too interested in damage. I mean, it's um, it's not really benign neglect, but what is benign neglect? Um, I kind of like benign neglect sometimes because it sometimes gets it to the point. So benign neglect is when you aren't caring for a piece, but you not caring for it is actually helping a piece. Mm -hmm. So um, it happens a lot with, um, like for example leather saddles. People think that caring for it is constantly applying dressings and that it's not caring for it. It actually damages it over time and encourages bacterial growth and biological growth. So sometimes just leaving it alone is the best thing that can happen because otherwise sometimes you have to remove mold and other things that are starting to grow that is eating the dressing that's being constantly applied because they think that leather needs to be oiled or whether on display needs to be oiled uh, more regularly than it actually needs to be. It just needs to be left alone. Or, yeah. mm -hmm. or pledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the worst. Yeah. Yeah. People feel like when they have historic furniture and they want it to look really nice, put a little pledge on it, wax it, make it look pretty, and pledge is not good for materials. It's very, you can't remove it once it's in a surface, and it affects the way the surface can be treated later. So sometimes just brushing the dust off with a soft cloth is plenty enough. <laughs>